I'm very grateful to the Jordan Center for hosting me and giving me this wonderful opportunity to work here for a while. So, um, uh, so my, my talk today is about the Soviet Preraborka meeting uh, meetings and the Kafkaesque experiences of uh, these forms of extra legal justice that uh, are revealed in uh, diaries and in uh, interviews with people who were either uh, accused of uh, misconduct uh, or who witnessed these rituals. Um, now, Prabutka uh, is known to anybody who lived in the Soviet Union in, 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 in a more or less uh, conscious state. So, 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 so this could happen in school, this could happen at work, at the university. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, army had their, their own uh, rituals uh, of um, uh, so the the honor uh, trials. So th this was an omnipresent ritual, and yet uh, it's like uh, you know something that was hiding in the light. To, to, to use the famous expression about youth subcultures. So, so people experience that, but, but, but these experiences have uh, not been particularly you know, uh, well analyzed. Although, uh, as I will explain later, there was a very important work by Alek Harkhorzin who looked at uh, the criticism and, cri and self-criticism uh, meetings um, and so on. So, Prarabutka were public meetings in uh, schools, uh, universities, and, and workplaces to condemn uh, ideological deviations, uh, violation of labor discipline, ca could be various acts of moral misconduct, such as uh, drunkenness in public places, or for uh, members of the party, or Komsomol, could be uh, infidelity, which would uh, would require then uh, if, if there was so-called signal from from a, an abandoned wife uh, or, or husband, you know, the, the meeting had to be called for, for this person to be publicly shamed. And also an important ritual of prarabutka uh, were the meetings uh, where people had to be shamed uh, with an ostensible. Uh, purpose of uh, getting a reference from, from, from the place of work before they could emigrate to Israel, which is itself, you know, uh, quite absurd and <laughs> Kafkaesque, because clearly the reference, the, 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 the reference could only be negative, <laughs> uh, but without such a reference, uh, they, co they couldn't uh, emigrate. And the part uh, fr from emigration where, where uh, the, the outcome was more or less clear. Uh, people who went through this ritual uh, were facing demotion at work, or sometimes they they, they could be uh, expelled from from the university or, or moved to another class in school and so on. So, so these were actually quite serious disciplinary or reputational uh, consequences, uh, which only could be averted if the collective refused to, to, to participate in this shaming, which, which happened, which did happen, but, but not, not too often. And uh, although this, this was seen to be as a kind of expression of public democracy, but in actual fact, uh, these trials uh, did not involve any particular deliberation. There was no evidence, like, let's say there would be a letter from a wife or, or you know who, who 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 was complaining about the husband being unfaithful but you know nothing was really the de the details were not uh, typically disclosed although of course there was a lot of prurient interest interest on behalf of the audience um, uh, so uh, the, the 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 point of the ritual was to condemn and apart from uh, these meetings, there were other mechanisms of uh, public justice, uh, such as um, shaming via uh, posters, uh, 
шейминг, шейминг все было всем газеты, and also patrols, все было дружины, and of course there were comrades, course, but comrade courts were based on, on uh, legal regulations, so I'm not really looking at them, although there were quite a lot of similarities too. So, uh, as Alec Harkordin uh, argued, the meetings of this kind were supposed to condemn acts that violated the Soviet moral and ideological norms in order to re-educate the person uh, and the collective in proper public behavior. And uh, yes, it's, uh, uh, th 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 this is true. Um, so so, so, so the, the, there was a particular moral or uh, disciplinary act of misconduct which was being condemned and, 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 and the people were supposed to share in the moral indignation. Now it's possible to, to look at this uh, at these events from a more um, ritualistic perspective, performative perspective, and uh, here it's interesting how uh, Garfinkel, a famous sociologist, uh, talked about McCarthy's uh, trials, which he observed in, in, in America in the 1950s, and he called them status degradation ceremonies which need to construct a malicious motivational schema that guide the actions of the denounced person and unite the group in moral indignation. So, so some, uh, it's, it's not just the act uh, itself, let, let, let's say drunkenness in public, but there has to be some kind of explanation that, that this is a person who has always been um, you know, um, misbehaving, we, and we saw this or that, and so, so the, the whole personality would be condemned essentially as evil. Now, uh, Zizek, although talking mostly about Stalin's uh, show trial, talks about carnivals of cruelty. He says that this is where um, this, these events had uh, terroristic properties that people were encouraged to um, express all kinds of effects and, and emotions which were uh, you know about anger and uh, and hatred and uh, maybe resentment and and, and uh, envy so, 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 so this is uh, this, this is about the emotional side of, of, of this uh, of, of these kinds of rituals essentially rituals of violence now, of course, uh, in the late USSR, like in, in the Stalin's times, you know, we, we're not looking at show trials, we're not looking at terror. Uh, there was a routinization of official practices, you know, sometimes they were even experienced as non-events, nothing much happened. And yet, uh, thinking about these meetings, people still expressed, um, a sense of trauma. Um, these were traumatic events, both for the victims and the members of the audience, uh, which, uh, which led, at least among people who believed in, 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 in any kind of uh, uh, way into the Soviet, in the Soviet values, led to disillusionment and alienation. So confusion, shame, guilt, and fear were experienced not just by the accused, but, but by, by the other participants. So clearly, you know, even, even though the meetings were not particularly forceful in uh, moral indignation, some lessons were taught, but, but not necessarily the obvious ones. Now, <laughs> these are two pictures. I haven't found uh, there was a of, of, of the one on the left. Uh, so so but this, this is a kind of idealistic representation of these meetings. And uh, on the right, this is a picture by Geli Kurjev, who was a quite, quite a well-known uh, socialist realist. <laughs> but in his spare time, he, he painted this kind of pictures. It's kind of hyper-real description, uh, depiction 
of, of, of the same kind of event. It's monstrous, right? So, so, so something horrible is happening here. Uh, so uh, from, from what I see analyzing many of the narratives on these events, they follow the logic of absurd uh, and grotesque. Now, of course, these narratives may have been influenced by the particular conventions of talking about the Soviet experience. And it's well known that uh, absurd and grotesque have, have been major feature of literary engagement with state socialism generally and late socialism in particular. And we know of Harms, Bulgakov, uh, the literature on the Soviet era and the Gulag, and also the hyper real descriptions of the Soviet everyday, uh, Vainovich, Zinovich, and so on. Now, what is absurd and grotesque? Uh, absurdity typically in literary uh, and uh, uh, theater theory and philosophy uh, signifies a vac uh, vacuum of sense, uh, social or existential meaninglessness and emptiness. Now, absurd coupled with horror uh, uh, makes it into grotesque. Now, grotesque, as a uh, famous author, on grotesque in literary and art, um, in literature and art, uh, uh, Wolfgang Kaiser said, uh, the grotesque world is and is not our own world. The ambiguous way in which we are affected by, by, by it results in, in the awareness that the familiar and apparently harmonious world is alienated under the impact of abysmal forces, right? Um, so, 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 so the, the reality suddenly becomes strange and terrifying and it loses its coherence. Now, this is just an example of um, description of absurdity. This, 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 this is a story by Tatiana who discusses how something that happened, you know, which she, she had, had no, no influence upon really, led to, to this horrendous prarabutka. Um, uh, she says, you know, her, 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 her dog chewed up her consumal card. Uh, she was uh, called into a meeting and she was accused and she didn't look after it. Uh, and she, she talks about this as a theater of absurdity. She was con being condemned God knows what for. Now, of course, you know, partly this absurdity results from the fact that by that time, by, 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 by the 70s and especially 80s, many of the taboos lost their meaning. Um, you know, uh, they were there, but, but, but the origins were quite unclear <laughs> to, 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 to Soviet people. Like, for example, the, the, this, uh, this uh, prohibition on damaging or destroying your consumal party card. Uh, it dates back to the early days of the Soviet power where the consumal and the party were supposed to be uh, the organizations of the elect, uh, you know, the kind of ascetic uh, orders. Uh, and you had to, you know, you had to treasure the, these cards, these symbols, which, which uh, uh, meant that you were part, uh, part of these orders. So, 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 but by the 1980s, so it, it all became uh, absolutely unclear. So, so that's why this was perceived as absurd. And grotesque, of course, is where horror comes in. Now, the monstrous performances where familiar figures, such as teachers or colleagues, you know, they, they suddenly show some kind of uh, cruel callousness would the desire to destroy you. Uh, and um, this is a story by, 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 by a woman who was a young, uh, nine years old at the time of the events, a schoolgirl. And she uh, went for a walk with, with two of her friends and some boys from the neighboring school started to mock them. Mm. And, they, and they, they wrote a, a little note uh, in, in using swear words, mud, to these boys. 
and Vaxana, she, she actually wrote this, this note and, and the note was passed by the Babushka grandmother of one of the boys to, to the militia police uh, station. And the police uh, woman came to school. And you can see here in this description, it's a combination of, uh, of comedy and horror uh, and references to absurdity and to Fellini, uh, this kind of incongruous performance. Uh, this woman with her, in, with her tight, tight, tight clothes, the, the, the note with, with mud words typed up. <laughs> and it was funny, but it was also terrifying. And uh, one of the worst thing was that the parents did not stand for, 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 for their children. And the parents were invited. This was actually quite an often occurrence. They had to be present, to be shamed as well. And although the parents used mud in, in, in everyday life, more or less, uh, but they, they at first started, uh, one person started laughing, but then he shut up. And, uh, and when Oksana came home, you know, the parents were very angry with her and she got this lesson, you know, that you cannot question power, even if power makes ridiculous uh, claims. Lesson of obedience. Now, another story is, is from uh, Galina. Uh, it's from 1968. And it happened at the time of Russian invasion into, uh, so the Soviet invasion in, of, of uh, Czechoslovakia. Now, uh, Galina was a very happy student, uh, enjoyed her studies uh, and uh, and then one day uh, she saw a note on the wall of, of, of the university, this Moscow State University, which invited uh, students, uh, an announcement which invited students to come to a meeting uh, to condemn amoral, immoral behavior. And they couldn't understand what that was about and, and uh, just decided to go and have a laugh because what kind of meeting about morality could they be? And then there was this, this, this young woman who was sitting there, uh, nobody asked any questions, uh, a real uh, out of the affair, no uh, deliberation. And she asked, uh, you know, what was going on? And nobody really told her, Galina. Uh, she drank, um, so made noise, was involved in immoral behavior, and you would not understand. Uh, and this girl was expelled from the university, and only later uh, she, Galina um, discovered that the, 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 the girl was critical of the Soviet invasion of uh, Czechoslovakia. So what were the lessons? That's a, a very interesting description because it sort of, uh, uh, you know, I would use Bourdieu's ideas of habitus, you know, her, 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 her and, and her friend's habitus, the way of being in the world changed uh, as a result of uh, this meeting. So everyone went home feeling extremely humiliated. They didn't go to any such events, but it played this meeting, played a key role in subsequent behavior, manners, right? If you remember Bourdieu their bodily presentation, even in, in their studies. So whether or not the collective moral indignation is mobilized, and here it wasn't, and there was no even aim to do it, uh, the participants are educated in the awesome power of institutions and the social and moral law uh, that they police. Now, uh, the law doesn't have to be clear. It doesn't have to be transparent. In fact, sometimes it's even better uh, for the authorities when it is not. And um, Zizek talks about this. Uh, where he says, uh, members of society uh, have an indeterminate Kafkaesque feeling of abstract guilt, a feeling that in the eyes of the power, I'm a priori, terribly guilty of, of something, although it's not possible for me to know what precisely I'm guilty of. And this can relate to 
people who are uh, blamed for something and even you know those who observe the, this uh, this uh, trials Uh, now, this, of course, uh, uh, takes us, us back to Kafka, the Kafkaesque. He's, of course, the author of uh, some of the most famous descriptions of, of the vague uh, and callous nature of law. Uh, for example, in, in his novel, The Trial, the hero, uh, Joseph K, wakes up one day to discover that he... he will be on trial and he doesn't know what for. And after his brief and unsuccessful attempt to investigate uh, what for, uh, he is executed. And uh, so, so, and in, in, in a novella, uh, The Penal Colony, uh, Kafka describes a situation where, where the prisoner doesn't know what he's accused of. Uh, and uh, there is this machine which, which inscribed, this, inscribed the sentence on the prisoner's back, and only then he kind of feels what he, he, he was accused of. And uh, writing about this, and Agamben, who, who, who actually writes a lot about Kafka, uh, says that the law is all the more uh, pervasive for its total lack of content. So, 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 so the vagueness of the law, uh, and, and actually the capacity of uh, the sovereign to remove uh, at will the law completely is, uh, is, uh, is a proof of sovereignty. Now, of course, you know, uh, just to say a few words about the relevance of this, uh, although, you know, I'm not talking about meetings, but I'm just generally now talking about this vague character of, of the law. Uh, these days, we're, you know, we're observing how all the veil, you know, of legality is removed. And what we see is kind of the monstrous uh, power machine in Russia. Uh, so, uh, this is where the absurd and grotesque nature of power gets, gets uh, revealed precisely. Now, this is from, from a report uh, published in, 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 uh, on a, on a uh, website uh, uh, by, by Media Resource 161 Rule. It's about a uh, young woman who was arrested. Uh, uh, she was uh, standing with a blank uh, piece of paper. And this is this Kafkaesque uh, dialogue. So the judge says, any questions from the defense? Advocate says, yes. Why did you approach her? What were your suspicions? So, so he's following the letter of the law. On the grounds of the state of emergency, right? Uh, but is there any particular document? Or you know this from mass media? I don't know what you know from the mass media. Are there any instructions perhaps for me? For me specifically? For you as a policeman, on what grounds? State of emergency, which is the, actually has not been announced uh, in the city, in the rest of oblasts, and in principle in Russia. But what were your objections to a person standing with a blank piece of paper? My objections personally, I did not know what her purpose was in being there. She was standing with a blank piece of paper, but if she turned it over, something might have been written there. So uh, to conclude uh, this, uh, we can see that individuals here are denied their previously assumed uh, rights and placed at the margins or outside the borders of society. Sovereign power or the law is clearly present, but it appears without communicating its meaning. In other words, coming back to, 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 to my case study, the unconvincing masquerade of justice that the Soviet moral trials involved based on premises which were not fully revealed and did not make complete sense 
uh, put the participants in the space of abandonment to group and institutional power uh, with their previous rights and identities removed and this experience produced narratives of absurd and grotesque. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm very much hopeful that, that our audience will have questions, you know, but uh, I will start with a couple of my own, if, uh, if you don't mind. So, uh, so the, the first is, and, and, you know, um, it's a strange role uh, for me to assume as a kind of an advocate on, on behalf of Soviet practices. But, uh, uh, you know, one does sometimes become, given the extreme atomization of contemporary post-Soviet societies, one is almost nostalgic uh, to think there was uh, actually this theater, uh, a society which, uh, which uh, you know, we, in which members get some relation with each other, including a moral relation. Um, and uh, uh, um, one can also assume some maybe even more positive uses of, uh, of these pre-robotica meetings, like uh, empowering women to extract some alimony from a wayward husband, or uh, you know, shaming the said husband into uh, into you know. Uh, you know, stopping drinking or some other other kind of behavior. So, uh, so I wonder whether there can be this more positive story told in addition to the grotesque and absurd <laughs> and oppressive uh, that you emphasized. Yeah. Um, well. Uh... Clearly, you know, this this is a very valid interpretation, and, and uh, uh, it's uh, in in principle one, one can see the potential of of, of such events. So, uh, you know, and, and in, indeed, you know, we have uh, now uh, restorative justice, which exactly attempts to do that to. to, to Kind of to, to shame, but also to re-educate uh, the offender or the person who you know committed some uh, some something you know um, quasi uh, criminal or whatever deeds uh, without sending them to prison and so on. Now, uh, from from what I see and and, the, and and from from some of the literature on restorative justice as well. Uh, the the use of shame, uh, particularly in 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 in, institu in in institutional settings, is actually quite destructive uh, for 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 persons uh, persons identity, and uh, there has been some some literature as well which uh, linked uh, you know shame and violence. Uh, so. so, so for, for, I mean, I mean in, in theory, I, I would agree with you. But, but in practice, you know, we're, to, to, you know, to, in my interviews, but also looking at the diaries, you know, when you look at particular offender, you know, and, and, and the response to shaming, you know, it's almost never kind of restorative. I think it's, it, it is actually kind of re, still it's a repressive uh, ritual. Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry, before we do... Uh, uh, call on, on our virtual participants to, uh, to who, who's, raised, uh, who's raised their virtual hand. Maybe I can, uh, you know, follow up on this question uh, in, in the sense that uh, a lot, um, I mean, I, I assume some cases which in, say, an American, North American uh, legal system would be really a question of courts. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Would have been dealt with in these prerobotic within these prerobotic uh, meetings, and I'm uh, just uh, curious what is the uh, the legal power of, uh, um, of those meetings? Um, you know, 
is it purely an employer? So, you know, in a workplace context, is it purely the employer's mandate? Or uh, so, so what, what empowered uh, the, mm -hmm. what empowers the collective to, to pass judgment? Yeah, um, so, so, um, the, the, these are, uh, um, workplace or place of study uh, disciplinary meetings. Uh, generally speaking, they are not based on any legislation. So, in, in fact, you know, so, 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 so uh, the, the work cases where Prabhutka was organized in order to expel a person from the Komsomolo Party organization before they could, could, could be subjected to criminal uh, law. Because, because there was a kind of perception that a true Komsomolo Party member could not commit a crime. So they had to be uh, ex, uh, expelled. So, so this, this, this could be part of the process. The only, uh, the only kind of quasi-legal quasi grounds for uh, Prarabutka existed in the case of um, people who wanted to immigrate to Israel, because there, there was an instruction of the Ministry of Interior, uh, according to which all, all uh, uh, companies or you know, uh, collectives had, had to organize this, this, this event for a person to get an exit visa. Now, uh, Conrad's courts, this, this was a, a, di a different procedure because they uh, they they more often looked at kind of you know at misbehaviors that uh, might or might not have been subjected to criminal punishment, uh, and uh, as well as you know so, so, so in some ways they 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 protected people from being criminally prosecuted for minor offenses or sometimes you know on the contrary if if the comrade court comrade uh, passed a negative judgment, that then the person would, would, could be prosecuted. Thank you. And we have a couple of questions, and one coming from an unnamed Olga. Olga, sorry, if, if Olga can uh, ask a question. Um, hi. I um, had a personal uh, experience with this type of ritual. Something in the 70s, I was in college and um, one of the students did something really stupid. And this type of prarabotka was done exactly to save him, not to condemn him. Because if we did not do this and did not say that it's not him but us, who to blame because we did not notice we should walk with him we should talk with him but we did not so of course it was all how to say it um no <laughs> it was absurd but everyone participated in this absurd and he was and uh, what he did it actually would not be even a problem for anyone but unfortunately, it was witnessed by other student who was a member of communist party. And actually this student was despised by everyone exactly because he was uh, a <laughs> member of communist party. So we saved him and he was not expelled from the college. But my question to you is different. You see, every society developed this tool of shaming, condemning. For example, in Bible, we have stoning, yes, or now we have cancel culture. And in cancel culture, you cannot save anyone. If you're on the wrong side of this problem, that you will be destroyed with this person. So could you put this ritual of prarabotka? Um, it's, let's say, the probably correct, uh, not correct, but some kind of close to literal translation is interrogation. So could you put this Soviet interrogation, this, this tool between like stoning, 
and council culture and put it in a historic context and yeah. compare how <laughs> what it is <laughs> Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Olga. Yes, um, yes, I, I completely take your, your, your first point. And uh, there, 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 there were occasions where, where, where uh, for, for friends and, and fellow students or workers uh, um, use, use this, this procedure in, 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 in the way it was uh, originally designed, is to be kind of democratic uh, ritual uh, in order to, to save. Uh, uh, so one of them. So, so this is this is absolutely right. Um, now, now you absolutely right as well about this this uh, this this long tradition of of public shaming rituals, and of course, you know this 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 one this pra uh, is is um, in some ways influenced by, by the Christian tradition, and Dalek Harkhorzin showed very well how how this practice is. Uh, were influenced by, by the Orthodox uh, tradition uh, and, and uh, cancel culture. Uh, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very good example of uh, public shaming where particularly on, on social media, there is a kind of, uh, people are, are given carte blanche to release all, all their uh, prejudices and envies and resentments. Uh, and then uh, institutions which are which are sort of afraid of, afraid of any bad publicity are, are using this uh, to uh, to create uh, uh, very serious reputational consequences for for for, for the for their members. So, so so yes, I mean this is something that I'm also looking at, and it, it is a very important point. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Next, we have Renata Mustafina. Uh, right. Uh, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Svetlana. Thank you very much for this uh, lecture. So I have two questions for you. One is uh, more like a methodological question. So what are the sources that you rely on here and how do you collect data for this uh, uh, wonderful research project? And my second question is about like more theoretical. So. Uh, so the, the 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 picture that you are painting here is like you know kind of this picture of like total coercion and domination and uh, uh, and I was wondering if uh, if there is any possibility to locate uh, resistance here like or resistances or you know some kind of even if we just like speak about the the mockery of this kind of rituals because I can imagine that some people are not very serious about this like meetings um, and and I think that my question also speaks to Olga's comment that. Maybe we can like think of these like uh, uh, public shaming meetings like uh, of their more diverse uses by the participants themselves. Yeah. So thank you very much in advance for your yeah. for your. Answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so so um, in terms of uh, the sources so far, I've been looking at uh, uh, oral history interviews and diaries. Of course, you know uh, they also. Um, archive uh, archives with lots of uh, protocols of, of this of these meetings, but but uh, I, I'm less interested at the moment, at least in um, in uh, in, in uh, investigating a whole range of cases or or, or official discourse. Um, more interested in in uh, in emotions uh, and. Um, in, in uh, getting an insight into personal relationships before the event or after the event. So, so in this, uh, that, that is why I think uh, oral history uh, interviews are, are, are so important. And, and there is, of course, show you the, what's, uh, the, the reflections at the moment, but again, show you uh, emotions uh, and, and uh, all this all this kind of relation aspects as well. Now, I must I must admit that this this um, uh, this the, the, today I was talking about this particular aspect of uh, Prarabut meetings, which is is about as you, as you completely rightly said, uh, coercion and domination. Uh, I've written more about this, and there there were also cases where uh, where people refused to uh, refused to participate. Uh, and and of, uh, also, of course, you know, there the was resistance for sure, uh, and 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 um, irony and laughter, 
and uh, uh, but, but this kind of ironic uh, rejection of uh, of the ritual doesn't mean that uh, the system didn't work. It, it, that it was sort of um, uh, disintegrating. That it was anomic. My my argument is that all the people could laugh, uh, and of course they did, but they still experienced. There was this combination, uh, which comes out in interviews of laughter and horror, uh, and and and, uh, and, and uh, the conformity of uh, most people with this uh, procedure. So, so, so this is my argument that, that laughter does not uh, does not um, that does not destroy the system. It just perhaps allows people to cope um, better. Um, hello, thank you very much for a very uh, thought provoking talk. Um, my question <laughs> refers to the uh, 1978 a film, a Hungarian film, Anji Vera. I, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly in Hungary, um, which um, I don't know whether it was shown in the um, Soviet Union and whether it was discussed in criticism or um, in, uh, let's say, official criticism or whether it was um, discussed orally at the time but um, I was with foreign students from uh, Yugoslavia and uh, elsewhere in the United States when it was shown and it provoked a great deal of discussion then. Thank you. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, we didn't see it. <laughs> Maybe some people did, but I don't remember it being uh, shown in the Soviet Union. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so there was, there was a, in, the, in the late, um, so, so, Soviet cinema, there, there, there were, um, you know, there was film, film uh, famous film, Afonia, about this, uh, but it was a kind of uh, a comedy. Um. Thank you, Yakuyu. Um, so I had a couple of uh, comments and questions. Um, when you were describing it, it was reminding me of the um, you know the, the Chinese Communist Party practice of criticism, self-criticism. So I wonder if you've done any comparisons. And also, I'm familiar that in like Western kind of leftist communist organizations, they also use this practice of you know the people sitting around in a circle criticizing the person sometimes for hours. Um, you know, and it's you know it was all about political correctness and you know making sure they had the party line pure and so forth. So I wonder if you if you could comment on in the both either of those comparisons. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I, I know about the Chinese um, uh, rituals. Uh, this uh, this this were this party, communist party rituals. Um, I, I, I'm not sure whether they extended to all members of the Chinese society, but, but of course there's pl plenty of similarities there. Uh, it's, it's so interesting about uh, about um, the second the second example that you give. I, I guess this 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 is um, uh, this, this this is an example of um, yes, you, as you said yourself, is is kind of trying to create consensus around the party line, <laughs> uh, which, um, which is a, a very interesting. So, so, so coming to an agreement about what is right, what, what is wrong, what is, uh, what is good, what is evil. Uh, I mean, this, 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 this is in some ways a similar practice, but uh, it's um, in, a, in, in a kind of different context because these, these are what I describe are institutional meetings where they were clear, Power, power arrangements there, which perhaps is not something, uh, power relations there, which is maybe uh, absent in more egalitarian settings that you discuss. Fantastic. Do we have any more questions? Um, if not, maybe I can ask one final one about uh, the scope of this project and, and the form you hope to take and, and what is left of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it was, it's, um, it's a huge, huge undertaking, I guess. Um, but uh, um, 
But I, I'm, I, I have been looking at um, I've been looking at, at, at these narratives of, of the late Soviet period. I, I'm, I'm thinking of looking uh, also at the literature, literary representations, because they're very, very, uh, there's a, lo a lot of them. Um, and and uh, I was thinking of, of doing something on about public shaming on social media. And then, of course, you know, after the start of, of the war with Ukraine, all these things seem to be so insignificant. <laughs> uh, all this, all this kind, kind of uh, animosities which were expressed on Russian social media, you know, seem very, very kind of passe now. So, so I, 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 I'm not sure whether I will be looking at it. So I'm, I'm in, in the process, like many of us, of rethinking what I'm doing. Thank you so much. Uh, this was really uh, educational. <laughs> Thank you for giving meaning. I, I know this phenomenon also from human literature, but now it's an entirely different thing to know so much about the, the coin mechanics. And Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rosen, and, and uh, thanks, uh, Sasha, and everybody uh, for, for organizing and uh, hosting this event. Thank you.